Hello all, Dave here bringing you yet another exciting episode of Xylogamoto. Today we're going to talk about the same thing that every other gaming channel on YouTube is talking about, the Sega Genesis Mini. Nah, screw that noise. Why would I do a video you might actually want to watch? Instead, we're talking about a true classic on the Genesis, Jeopardy. Ooh. All kidding aside, the next two episodes I will go ahead and work on reviews for Tetris and Darius from the Mini. As Darius was completely a new release for the Mini, and Tetris might as well have been. But for this week's episode, we're talk taking a look at the home version of Jeopardy on the Sega Genesis. Previously, Jeopardy had appeared several times on the NES in games developed by Rare, of all companies, if you can believe that, and then published by Game Tech, who held the license at the time. After moving on from the NES, Game Tech, who still had the license to produce Jeopardy, related games for home consoles, worked with developer Park Place Productions. If that name sounds familiar, it's because Park Place Productions also created NHL slash EA Hockey, John Madden Football, and Joe Montana Football. I'm not exactly sure how Game Tech managed to get two great developers to work on their Jeopardy games, and then allow that travesty that was American Gladiators to occur, but it happened, and if you're curious about the worst game we've covered so far, go look at episode 28. If you're not familiar with what Jeopardy is, or why there's numerous video games based on it, well, first I would point you to Weird Al Yankovic's classic parody, I Lost on Jeopardy. But to sum up, Jeopardy is a TV quiz-based game show that first aired in 1964, with a modern version of the show starring Alex Trebek, who has been at the podium for the last 35 years in an impressive hosting run. As mentioned on last week's video, Alex Trebek is so ubiquitous in U.S. culture that Saturday Night Live utilized Will Ferrell to play him, his role, in numerous times. And that toy manufacturer Funko released not one, but two figures based on Alex. The game itself consists of three players competing throughout three rounds of gameplay to win cash for the top player dubbed the champion. And in the TV show, that champion returned for the next episode to attempt to win more money and so on and so forth until they're finally defeated by a new Jeopardy! champion. Being a quiz-based show, players must answer questions about various subjects, and each are worth a certain given value, except for special daily double and final Jeopardy! questions that allow the player to wager some or all of their current money based on the subject. And that's more or less the whole game. There are no special games or physical challenges interspersed. It all comes down to if you know the answers to the questions or not with the only caveat being that any wrong answers lose you money, so you have to be very strategic about only answering questions that you really have a high percentage of being correct about. So, how well does Jeopardy! translate to the Genesis? And did Park Place assign some decent programmers to this effort? Or do we have another American Gladiators on our hands? Well, let's take a look. And here is Jeopardy! Sorry, I, I had to do that. Uh, anyway, it's in a standard-looking uh, Genesis black case. Uh, or, or is it? Uh, if you look very closely at the background, and I don't know if you'll be able to make this out on the camera or not, but it's not a solid black background or a black, black grid background, but it's a black background with dark gray question marks interspersed throughout. You can kind of make them out there, I believe. Uh, American Gladiators was set up in the same way, however, it had a bunch of stars in the place of the question marks, and they were a lighter shade of gray, so they stood out more. Uh, the actual cover is pretty standard fare, a shot of the Jeopardy! studio with the uh, early 90s Alex Trebek and the logo at the bottom. Um, I do like how the uh, logo stands out on the spine. That looks pretty sharp there. Uh, there's no mistaking what game this is. Uh, the box itself is in good shape, with the uh, hang tab intact. And just minimal nicks to the uh, corners of the spine right there. Uh, flipping over the back, there are uh, four screenshots that are bad, uh, but are definitely pictures taken of the game running on a TV rather than screen captures. Uh, and you can tell because if you look very closely, they're all a little fuzzy. I'm not sure if you can tell that or not on there. Um, and they lean down to the left. I, I, mean, I hate seeing cheap pictures. I understand that um, you know doing proper screen captures might have been more expensive back then, but the uh, the in-game graphics 
are one of the most uh, important things that are going to sell a game back in 93. So how does having crappy ones help you out? Um, over to the right of that, there's the usual text describing the game. Right through there, including a bit about just how many categories and questions the game has. Which is important because when these types of games don't have many questions, it doesn't take long to memorize all the answers that you don't already know. And at that point, there's really no reason to play anymore. I like to point out a specific line, uh, let's see, with over 3,500 new questions and answers, or is that answers and questions, and 700 categories. It's sure to last many seasons without reruns. Ha ha. Uh, well, that might be true, but I've got a small beef with that statement that I'll go over when we get to that part of the review in a bit. Uh, for the text about the game, Game Tech decided to lighten the background and and make it a lighter gray, which you can see here, uh, to allow the black text to stand out. But they didn't get rid of the question marks, which are now much easier to see. And the problem with that is, uh, you know, even though you've got black text on gray background, which normally is readable, the, the question marks screw it all up and make the text much more difficult to read than it should be. One last strange thing about the cover that led me down a bit of a rabbit hole is if you look where there should be a blank space between the Game Tech logo here and the Genesis logo, uh, you'll see this ballistic sticker. And I do mean sticker because it's not on the outside cover, but this is actually a sticker that's on the, the inner cover. Um, and if you remember from episode 11 when we talked about Super Off-Road, uh, that game was published by Ballistic as well, which was a label that Accolade used for the arcade ports. So, say, Double Dragon would be considered a Ballistic game. Uh, so, why does Jeopardy have a Ballistic sticker on it when it's a Game Tech game? Well, apparently, later on in the Sega Genesis lifespan, popular catalog games were actually reprinted by other companies to keep product on shelves. One company that did this was Majesco, who you may be familiar with because they were actually the company that had licensed the rights from Sega to produce the Genesis 3. So they had a significant interest in making sure there were still some games that could be played on their version of the console. And if you've never seen a Genesis 3 or don't know what the hell I'm talking about, the short version is the Genesis 3 is a very small, bare-bones Genesis that has no support for the Sega CD or the 32X, and I think there's some games that don't work on it as well. However, apparently Accolade participated in this reprinting business as well, and that's why this copy has that sticker on the back. So it's technically not an original 1993 copy of Jeopardy. Not that that matters in the slightest, but I did find the whole situation interesting and had no idea it was even a thing until doing this review. As we open it up, the manual's in great shape, which makes sense if this was a later reprint. And that cartridge looks good as well. You know, really, you know, pretty much, uh, it's, a, it's a cartridge. Uh, no, no, no tears or damage to the label there. Uh, in fact, this game even still has its warranty card. You can kind of see sticking out of the manual here. If I can pull this out. Right here. I, I, I promised that there it is. And the card is in here. Um... And the warranty card refers to Majesco instead of Accolade? Well, I, I guess these late reprints reference Majesco and warranty cards because they had the console license. But in the in the late days, I mean this is just this is really confusing trying to figure all this out. Um, the manual does its job and spells out how to play the game. And has an entire page at the beginning about uh, the controller options for having two or three players. Let me see if I can... Yeah, right here. This how to use controller page. This, this documents if you're using one or two controllers or have one, two, or three players here. Uh, and in the back, it has some tips on how to properly answer the questions in the game in an effort to save the player some frustration, so that's nice. Um, there you go, some hints on gameplay right there. However, on the page before that, uh, let's see. Actually, no, not that page. I apologize. Where is this at? Here. Uh, how to play Final Jeopardy. This was 
This was some kind of weird. Um, check out this boldest section under how to play Final Jeopardy. Um, at this time, all players should turn away from the screen and should stay turned away until the contestants has have completed placing his her wager and entering his her response. What? Um, I mean, I guess it kind of makes sense because, you know, it would be cheating to see another player's answer to, you know, before your turn, but there's actually a bigger problem here than that, and I'll go over that in a minute. Uh, okay, well, that's the package. I'm sure I spent way too long on that, so let's go ahead and get to the game itself without further delay. So I know full well then doing this channel that there are going to be some less interesting games that I end up reviewing, since I'm looking at everything. And in 2019, or whatever far-flung year this video is being watched at, there probably isn't much interest in a game based on a licensed TV game show property, where there's been many releases since then on more powerful consoles. They'll be much more appealing to play due to having improved graphics, sound, etc. But just for a second, put yourselves in the shoes of a gamer back in January of 1993. Literally, the week I was doing this review, I happened to see on Twitter a picture from a department store catalog, more than likely Sears, that showcased the Genesis in a few games, and one of those games was Jeopardy, right alongside Streets of Rage and Toe Jam and Earl. The price of Jeopardy? $59.99, just the same as all the other major releases. You are the category. So regardless of whether the game is considered worthy of discussion 26 years later, in 1993, it sat on the same shelf and cost the same amount as titles that we do still talk about today. And because of that, I feel it's important to discuss this game and its sequels, and any other game we might consider inconsequential, just to give historical light to what it was like in the late 80s and early 90s. Having said all that, Jeopardy is definitely one of the simpler games to appear on the Genesis console, as you might expect. What we have here is a no-frills representation of the experience of appearing on one episode of the TV show. I emphasize the one episode aspect of the previous sentence because after choosing who the three players are, whether they are human or computer-based, you proceed to play a single game of Jeopardy. And after Final Jeopardy determines who wins the game, the credits roll and it's time to start over if you want to play another game. Which is fine and is technically an accurate representation of the television show, but it definitely feels like an assignment that was given to a programmer to replicate the show, and absolutely nothing else. You are correct. There's no high score screen to track the best runs in the competition, which seems like it would be a simple addition. And, if you're choosing to play a single player game, there's no option to continue after winning a game and take on two new computer opponents to potentially raise your high score. Now granted, the rules in Jeopardy were different back in 1993, and contestants were only allowed to win a maximum of five games in a row before being replaced, as opposed to now, where you keep going until you're defeated. But they could have at least had a mode in the game where the goal was to try to win those five games, and set a high score based on that. The lack of game modes and options here really screams budget game, even if Sears was selling it for full price. Response. Back to the actual game. When playing around, you have the choice to play between one, two, or three human players, with any contestants not being played by a human automatically assigned to the computer. However, the game does not support any type of multi-type device. So, if you would like to play with two players and only have one controller, or play with three players, a controller would have to be shared, with one player using the D-pad to buzz in and answer questions, and the other using the A, B, or C buttons on that same controller. It's a bit unwieldy, to be sure, but in January of 1993, it was the only way to support three players, as none of the various four-player adapters had been released for the Genesis yet. And it's actually a slick way to support two players if you only have one controller. But really, buy a second controller. I mean, come on, people. Once the players have been chosen, it's time for you to choose your avatar and name your character. And here's another place where I have to complain about the game being a bit budget-minded, from a programming perspective. When correct. choosing your avatar, the game gives you five to choose from. Three males and two females. Really? That's it? Just five possible characters? They couldn't at least include a third female character for a game with three women? 
It just screams laziness. As far as naming the character goes, this next bit I could go either way on. Some video games, when you go to name your character, it'll have a filter included that doesn't allow you to give your character a foul name, if you want. This game, surprise surprise, does not have that word filter included, which was definitely easier on their part, so that they didn't have to code that into the game. But for selfish reasons, I somewhat like that it's uncensored. I'm an adult, and if I want to name my fake Jeopardy player Asshat, well, I, I should be able to do that. Once the players have chosen their avatars and named their characters, no, the it's time one. to play Jeopardy. Any computer controlled players will have their names and avatars chosen at random and will be fully controlled by the computer, which consists of picking clues when it's their turn, attempting to buzz in an answer, and participating in daily doubles in Final Jeopardy. The goal of the game is simple. Beat your opponents, either human or virtual, in the scoring the highest score, and then walking out Jeopardy champion. And that's it. Win or lose, you can play again okay. if you want, but all you're doing is playing another round of Jeopardy, as nothing carries over from round to round. The actual process of playing a game is more or less what you would expect, if you're familiar with the TV show. After a category and dollar amount are chosen by either the player or the computer, depending on who has control, an answer from that category is displayed on the screen, very similar to the television show. There's a brief delay that represents the amount of time it would take Alex to read the answer, and then a countdown clock of 10 seconds starts, upon where a player can buzz in and attempt to provide the question for the answer, or if the player doesn't know the question, they can let the computer attempt to answer. And sometimes the computer will get it right, and sometimes they won't. Frequently, when playing the game in single player mode against two computer opponents, one player will be pretty good, and the other not so good. Providing the proper questions for the answers given does cause a small bit of heartburn. After you buzz in, a long line that has letters and a second line that has numbers and symbols is provided, and you have to select each letter and number one by one by moving the cursor back and forth across the screen. For short questions, it's not so bad, but typing in something like John Wilkes Booth can be a bit of a pain. Also, you have to be very specific with your responses. As say, for instance, with one clue, you I answered correct. egg roll, got it wrong, and then the computer answered behind me Easter egg roll and got it right. I was not happy. Another issue I had with the clues and categories is the randomness at which they're provided, or lack thereof. If you remember, on the back cover of the game, it advertises over 3,500 3, new questions and answers in 700 categories. And this may very well be true, but in the first five rounds I played to write this review, out of 60 presented categories, I had one category twice, one category three times, and then the same Final Jeopardy question in back-to-back -back rounds. If the presented numbers are accurate, I find those odds a bit off. You are correct. Granted, before you start Jeopardy or Double Jeopardy, you can make the computer pick new categories by hitting the C button, which is a nice feature, but I can only imagine that it won't take long to start getting bored of the same clues being repeated. One last problem is something I alluded to earlier when we were looking at the manual, and that's how Final Jeopardy is presented. In the TV show, the category is announced, and then all three players write down their wager based on the category and the current scores. Then the Final Jeopardy question is asked. Here, that process isn't followed. Instead, each player is asked for a wager, then is presented with a question to answer, and then it moves on to the next player, etc. The problem with this, especially if you are leading in points, is that you get to see, albeit briefly, what the final Jeopardy question is when the other competitors are answering the question, so you know ahead of time if you should wager any money or not. This is a huge problem, and honestly, I can't believe they produced the game like this, with just the disclaimer in the manual that you're not supposed to look at the screen when it's the other player's turns. You are correct. I hope they fix that in subsequent games, because it's a pretty major oops. Both the audio and the graphics, like the rest of the game, are fairly bare bones. There's a nice digitized picture of Alex that you see when no one gets an answer correct. And the studio set looks like it does on television, complete with a background changing colors depending on if it's Jeopardy or Double Jeopardy. But that's about it. The avatar's facial expressions will change if they get a question right or wrong, which I thought was a nice touch. But then there's also an ugly bug where long clues will overlay the timer in the bottom right corner of the screen. So I'm not sure where their priorities were. 
Jeopardy theme song is represented as you would expect, and there's some voice samples of Alex telling you if you're correct or not, but they're not exactly the highest you know quality. The all in all, I'm giving Jeopardy two stars out of five. It's not specifically a bad game, and definitely a much better effort than American Gladiators was, but unless you just love Jeopardy, I don't really see much of a reason to play this. If you do, you'll get a No Frills virtual version of the TV show, but it would have been nice to see them go above and beyond these base requirements in the name on the cover of the box. Okay, that was Jeopardy. I can't believe I was actually able to come up with that much to say about this game, but sometimes things just start flowing when you get behind the keyboard. I'm sure I'll struggle to write about the next two games on the Genesis and the Sega CD release, but those are problems for another day. Tune in next week when we explore the Sega Genesis Mini, like I mentioned at the top of the episode. But will it be a review for Darius? Or will it be for Tetris? Well, you're just going to have to be in suspense for the next week, because truth be told, I haven't actually decided yet. Remember, whatever you play, have fun, and be excellent to each other. Later.